everyone, I'd like to welcome you all to this evening's lecture and it is with great pleasure that I have the opportunity to welcome back John Renshaw. John comes to us with a diverse and well-versed experiential practice co-joined with formal studies dating back to the 70s. For decades, John has integrated considerable knowledge of oriental medicine and yoga, formulating client-led focus on different conditions and imbalances that affect the person, and in this instance, the person being body, energy, and mind. From 1976 to the present, he has attended numerous retreats in India, Europe, North and South America, receiving teachings on Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, Bon and Dzogchen, and when possible training in different forms of Tibetan yoga, such as Salong and Chulkur. And this is directly from many eminent Tibetan lamas, Rinpoches and yogis. So in particular, these include Dujong Rinpoche, Dilso Kense Rinpoche, Chagdo Tulku, Lopon Tenzin Nandak, Tenzin Wanjil Rinpoche, and with his principal teacher being Chokyal Nam Kainobu. And in 1979, 1985, and 2001, he received diplomas of Yantra Yoga second level directly from Chokyal Nam Kainobu and has been teaching continually since then with evening classes, um, weekends, and residential courses in the UK and in Europe. And these also include retreats. In 1979, and this has continued to the present day, he has worked professionally with massage, bodywork, shiatsu, twena, and the Roycester system, which is a deep tissue, connective tissue um, system. Um, this helps with creating biofeedback used in conjunction with yoga and meditation. And since 1985, he has taught regular eight-week evening courses at different adult education colleges on subjects such as traditional Chinese medicine, um, medicine, breathing, meditation, stress management, self-healing, and biofeedback. In 1986, um, when he was training in acupuncture and oriental herbal medicine at the London School of Acupuncture, which is now the University of Westminster. In 1987, he did his postgraduate clinical training in Nanjing, China, in 1989, he had a, a two-year apprenticeship training in Kenpo, which is a Japanese style of Chinese herbal medicine. Um, and, the, and he has also done professional training in yoga therapy at the Minded Institute with a focus on mental health. I'm going to go on to John's special interests, and, and he has a, a very personal interest in over many years in the main East Eastern systems of medicine self, and self-development. He has developed, as you can imagine, an understanding of the similarities in the application of energy, which is sometimes called qi, prana, lung, um, in uh, Chinese uh, Ayurveda and Tibetan medicine, retrospectively. John has been able to integrate aspects of these separate streams of knowledge and utilizes them in his practice and in his teaching. He has continued training throughout his career, attending seminars and workshops in specialized areas such as dermatology, respiratory diseases, gynecology, immune disorders, internal medicine, gastrointestinal, mental and emotional disorders, and muscular skeletal problems. So incredibly well versed. And just to go on a little bit about um, his teaching background, I think what I think you'll be getting a sense of is that he comes to us with a wealth of teaching experience and dedicated personal and professional practice. And John has continuously taught yoga breathing, um, sometimes referred to as pramayamas, and meditation in classes, courses, and one-to-one -one sessions for many years. He is presently the most senior Tibetan Yantra yoga teacher in the UK and is recognized 
as a high level teacher internationally in this unbroken lineage. So without further ado, um, I'd like you to join me in welcoming John to this evening's uh, lecture. It's a webinar uh, in which he will be just giving you a little taster, a little background about Tibetan Yantra Yoga. Um, and then we will be doing some demonstrations and we'll have a, a, this fantastic opportunity to speak directly with him with any questions or if there's anything else that you would like um, further explanation on. Okay, thank you. John, please. You can hear me okay? Yeah, nice. yep, perfect, loud and clear. Thank you so much. Okay, so, uh, okay. So we'll crack on. First is a discussion, I use a PowerPoint. So uh, I'm gonna uh, share that. And so we have some images and things to read and I'll talk over it. Um, I'll do that for 15, 20 minutes. And then we'll, I'll do some demonstrations of uh, Tibetan yoga from the Yantra tradition. Uh, and then I'll try and make enough time at the end for the questions. So I'll get this slides up. Okay. I might get closer to that. I can operate the computer. So basic principles in Tibetan yoga. I'm not sure of your background, but uh, from the promotional stuff, uh, you may have interest or know a little bit about Tibetan yoga, but I have to assume some of you don't. So I'm not exactly sure where to pitch it. So it's very general. So um, Tibetan yoga is called Trulkor or Trulkor Naljo. Uh, sometimes it's called Salong Trulkor. And Trulkor can mean magical movements or breathing with movements. Um, it can also, it, it's really working with energy, this uh, idea. The way it's translated is like that. Naljo is the equivalent of when we talk about yoga in general. So this can translate and we understand like, it can mean like the knowledge of our condition or our primordial condition. Now uh, is like something authentic or original. And, and jaw is the discovering this. So this is, uh, gives us an idea of what we're trying to do with movements, breathing, and going towards this um, more essential point. So the meaning of Naljo is a little bit more similar, but to, to yoga or the general term of yoga, but a, a little different. And Sa Long, Sa is uh, a general term. It can mean channels, chakras, it can mean uh, nervous system, it can mean even blood vessels. So it's a very generalized. In practice, when they talk about channels, it, it, it's often referring more to the idea of like the meridians or nodes or which run through the body and, and which you'll find in Ayurvedic medicine, both in uh, yoga sutras and so forth, or as an acupuncture, we say meridians, for example. So a lot of the time it means that, but not only that, it's a broader picture. Circulation, uh, initially for most of us, it means not enough circulation or it's not in the right place. So we do yoga to improve and help and balance and coordinate this energy, prana, in Tibetan it's called lung. Or Chinese medicine, you know, it's called qi. But anyway, we, we'll stick with the lung and prana. Yantra is not Tibetan, it's more, it's a Sanskrit word. So it, it can mean geometrical shapes, astrological bodies. It can mean like mandalas or trigrams. Uh, when, if you're looking at them as meditational supports or aids, it seems to, they seem to move, but it's your energy that's moving, same as the uh, astrological bodies. So the, the word yantra is really this concept of movement, again, so which is features strongly in Tibetan yoga. 
but it's also not only movement. There are like asanas and you're moving into a static position and sculpturing and shaping a particular breath and dynamic. So it's both movement and like asana. There are other types some that come under Lujang, Lujang, body training movements or Nijang. There are different names. And more modern, there, there can be other considerations of Tibetan yoga, which are not just the typical Hatha yoga, Indian style yoga system. So it's a very broad term. The more common systems of yoga, maybe not common to the yoga public as such, but are common in Tibet, where particularly in Tibetan Tantric Buddhism is the six yogas of Naropa, or sometimes called the six dharmas. And uh, Tumo or Inner Heat, they have, uh, this is also traditionally been quite a advanced practice based on based on Kumbhaka and done in a very reserved more kind of secretive way in certainly in Tantra where you would need to be a, to do a lot of preparation with um, initiation with a deity yidam transformation and these other types of yoga which can be relating to different aspects of di uh, uh, life sleeping dying uh, and you know, it, they're very, very profound and, and advanced practices. So this group, and there are several traditions, and even some from Niguma, a woman tradition. So there are several traditions and found in most of, most of the lineages in Tibetan Buddhism. But most of them are uh, in Tibetan Tantric Buddhism. And they, all, and they find also in Dzogchen, but we'll see later the application is slightly different. Yeah, this is from um, the Six Dalai Lama's Secret Temple. A few years ago, the fantastic exhibition Ian Baker put on in the um, Houston Road in London at the Welcome Foundation. And it was all about this with the blessing and guidance of the Dalai Lama. So this was going into uh, Tibetan yoga and these very esoteric positions and movements. I mean, if, you, if it was a video, they would be moving most of them and doing, doing strange stuff. And often you'd see things coming out the head or chakras and channels, and it would give you an idea of the broad sc scope and uh, application of some of the practices, uh, many of them quite advanced. But you'll see some of the movements here. We'll go into them later where you're manipulating and moving and guiding prana for a specific set purpose and an outcome. When we look at the Yantra yoga more specifically, rather than Tibetan yoga, then this is a, a tanker, a modern tanker commissioned by a friend of mine, John Shane. And it nicely depicts the lineage we have today, down to the present time, the Yantra yoga. So people may have heard of Papasambhavaru brought, uh, instigated and brought the uh, teachings of Buddhism into Tibet. So he was orally transmitting this to Varachana in the central figure here. And then unbroken lineage through recent years, then uh, Togden Ogin Tenzing in the top left uh, was teaching this to Nankai Nobu. My teacher unfortunately died in, September 2018. And in his early days, uh, when he was younger, this was clarified in, in different occasions, also by Jimmy Dorji and his main, his principal teacher, who was very old when he met him, Chanchal Dorji. So there's different opportunities where he could clarify this talk or Yantra Yoga. Uh, and then when you arrived in the West, principally to, to Italy, uh, until today, there's an unbroken lineage. So we see in the bottom left some movements more familiar to like happy yoga, but uh, these are, we'll see movements where you move into them, shaping the breath and the hold, which is the primary focus of uh, Yantra. Also important to differenti differentiate from Tibetan yoga, where most of Tibetan yogas are in, in Tibetan Tantric Buddhism. So in Tantra, and, and, and differentiate 
from that to Dzogchen. So this is a Dzogchen view, as is the entrance part of Dzogchen. So this Dzogchen view is a very simplistic view and this subject could be the basis of many books and years of practice and years of retreats, but in simple terms, and we use this a lot in, in yoga in general. So you, you come to the mat with your issues and you want to better yourself, feel relaxed, get healthy and meditate or whatever your reasons are. But it's, it's somewhat of a, an attitude in general for cleaning and purifying and opening up stuff. And also we start to, when we get serious, we start to take on board a, an attitude like um, to, to renounce things. And we, we take on, follow a diet and we, we start to maybe move to the countryside and we start to become vegetarian or vegan or whatever. And so we, we, t we take on, in the West at least, take on this behavior like a, a renunciation and we try to simplify and purify. So mostly we, in yoga, we see this, the, we can deal with this type of avoiding because we need to, we need to change our diet. We need to avoid this exercise or movement because it hurts our knee or our problem. So we avoid, we renunciate. So it's a major uh, way or view and application in yoga, of course. And, and should be, it's really like awareness and so forth. But when we look more at um, tantric methods, whether it's in tantric Buddhism or in using tantra from a point of view as Dzogchen, we're using a different approach, like with tools or methods to change or transform the situation. So it's, it's a different attitude, a different way. So in terms of yoga, in terms of the salong or trokho, we start to work with this energy and then these, like these images you saw in the Lukang in the Dalai Lama's secret temple, they're doing stuff there. They've already gone through probably phases of a void and now they're really transforming stuff in a very essential and simplified way. And the third one, it's an important view to consider in yoga in general, pranayamas and meditation, contemplation, all of that spiritual stuff self-development stuff is do you just stay all the time cleaning and avoiding and uh, that way well a lot do but and sometimes they might miss out a little bit on this radical abiding or integration of body voice and mind so voice is more representing the emotions the the breathing the energy aspect and to be a complete path eventually we need to work with the mind some type of uh, support or meditation towards contemplation so this word Rigpa then is our super important and you can translate, Rimshi used to translate this as in the presence of the, your own awareness, which is pre-existing, everybody has that, but somehow is obscured and lost it. So through uh, the physical body and moving and breathing and meditating, we <clears throat> try to re reconnect and discover back into this, this state. So this is an important consideration in, in uh, Dzogchen and Yantra. So when you come to yoga, you, you come to the mat and cushion, mat being more physical exercises, cushion, you might be doing pranayamas, sitting to do some sort of meditation, or you could be singing, chanting, etc. But it means uh, body, voice, and, and possibly mind. And what's this strange thing on the right? It looks like a strap. Well, yeah, it's a horse uh, saddle and reins. So what we bring is, from the point of view, it's used a lot in Tibetan Tantric Buddhism, and we use it. Many teachers use this concept. I love this concept. So here are these, some of these um, sad examples and strange examples of horses. are They're just symbolic of our energy, not your physical body, so what you bring to the mat and is this wild uh, horse, this, this wild energy, this wild prana. And of course you have your own characteristics, you're nervous, you're, 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 you're sleepy, you're depressed, you're, you're broken, you've got injuries, you've got all kinds, you know, you, the whole mixture of individual unique characteristics you bring to the mat and cushion. So we need to address those to feel better. Uh, and, we, and then we try with the, like the horse analogy, the mind is like the lame rider. 
uh, mounting this this wind, if you like, this this energy. And so the practice, of course, is embodying and connecting. You get your legs there, you put them into the reins, you grab the bit. So we're moving, we're breathing, we're, we're guiding, we're doing stuff to body engaging in postures and movements and so forth. The voice, uh, speech or energy aspect often relates to, to breathing. It could also relate to mantras and so forth. But the mind eventually grounded in its natural state via whatever methods and tools you get to. So it's realistic then when we come to the mountain cushion that you need a special saddle, you might need a shield to protect yourself, that's like religion. You may need a, you know, most religions have signposts, they're gradual, kind of gradual. So you need signs along the way. You need a special set of reins. Whatever you need is just perfect. It's appropriate for you at the time. So here is a sim symbolized by an, in, a, a, an Aboriginal, an Indian, without reins, shield is something more naked. So trying to depict, okay, we've really got a good connection. I understand the terrain. I don't need paths, you know. So this is a, an idea of connected, the rider and the horse. If we, the majority of, as I pointed out, of yoga, which is somewhat reserved and secretive because first of all, you have to go in, in tantric Buddhism. So most of yoga is using uh, path of transformation. So often you, you would transform your sense of self, this strange looking horse, individual characteristics you bring to the mat. But here you might transform yourself like in the character on the right is um, holding a perva and many instruments and very wrathful. Padrakilaya, uh, lots of symbology. We could go into this all evening explaining these things, but, but this is a, a, a typical idea. Mo more often wrathful because we're working with our energy, which is mostly having these kind of issues. But there are three main characters. There's also joyful and, and, and blissful. But here, in modern terms, we can understand the principle of transformation. You know, we see many films where, where we have characters with suddenly transforming with superpowers with some particular instrument or quality, and they're super popular with kids. Uh, my kids, when they were young, were watching something called Dragon Ball Z, or and then also Power Rangers, and they're only you know not so big, and they put that on, then stick the uniform on, and then start flying around the room. Suddenly, they had tremendous power and capacity, they transform. I mean, it's a, it's a similar principle, only this looks all very serious and heavy and esoteric. But I, use, I like that because it's a similar, it's used all the time. Also, when we look at uh, the joyful, we are, we're often working with sensation. Here you see a, a Vajrasattva yab, yab yam, and then the sort of modern Modern Tantra is quite confused and sometimes maybe it's helpful. You're working with couples and so forth, but there's a, there's a lot of misunderstanding about Tantra and this aspect and confusion. And generally in, in Tibetan yoga, to illustrate that when we talk about chakras, we don't even go to the bottom chakra. We cut that out initially because it's so powerful. So we tend to work a bit with, with five main chakras. Later, if you really on the horse have capacity, yes, maybe, but it's just too powerful and you get distracted and sucked into it. So typically in Tantra, the often the Vajrayogini is one of the main vehicles of transformation. Here's a more modern joyful one related from my teacher. And this, uh, this image, you transform your sense of self into this dynamic feminine characteristic and then you start the journey inwards with movements and so forth. If you go inwards, we need maps like chakras and channels. These are just, if you look on the internet, there are thousands, all kinds of colors and shapes. Uh, and then of course, with different, if it's a pure lineage or tradition, we'll have specific ideas and symbols, normally related to ancient Indian motifs or symbols or Tibetan or elements uh, or letters. But if we understand that in a modern perspective, it's, um, we could also interpret it and re rewrite and redraw that. 
fortunately in Dzogchen, and here are some teachers. One on the left, again, is from Ian's, Ian's book on uh, Tibetan yoga, showing what is quite seductive and attractive for some people, this dynamic aspect of jumping up into lotus and, and coming down. So this person, advanced yogas, would have been done all the visualizations and the channels and holding the breath, and then is dropping to develop sensation and have an experience because of manipulating the prana. He's done this thing, you can see also somebody I studied with in India many, many years ago, and uh, also this, these yogis I met in Nepal. This is a typical uh, posture we use to help control, align the posture and then control the energy inside when you're doing pranayama, especially like the sort of king of pranayama is Kumbhaka, and then doing uh, advanced type practices. But fortunately, the inner maps we use in Dzogchen, even though the others are fantastic, and if you're training them, that's perfect as well. But here we use this um, simplistic approach, more essential view when you go internal. This is not for beginners. This is when you've already got on the horse, open the body up, you know how to breathe, and you say, okay, now we start to get subtle and go internal. It's definitely not so much mat, it's all on the cushion stuff. So the emphasis here is a simplicity method. And it's uh, by the virtue of its unique view of ever-present wholeness and non-duality, non-dual systems. Uh, to know and experience the essence and nature and energy of one situation. Well, that's a big shout. And again, this, this words could be a book. It's, it's quite profound. In fact, there are books on this. So I'm just giving a, a, a title, if you like. So, but the approach we, we, we can apply to yoga then is this is to maintain this beginner's mind or, or like this essence of this beginner's mind in this case is rooted in this famous Buddhist concept emptiness. But there's not only that, there's also movement. It's nature is clarity and the energy is the unceasing non-dual manifestation. These are very profound uh, statements but it's good to know the end view. And as I say, that is a book far beyond the scope of this chat today. But if we if begin beginning to bend yoga and you want to go the full, to the full range, we start to then, uh, it, there's a certain uh, necessary that for this information to be pointed out so we have knowledge of this. And then when we take the horse more on this inner journey, we know where we're going and, and uh, how we can arrive there. So if we look at forces when we're on the mat and cushion, these are quite invisible. We take them for granted. And we call them in modern terms, exterior section, external forces, uh, center of gravity, the ground you're sitting on. Well, yeah, of course, I go to a studio, yoga mat. It's kind of obvious, but the pressure we're in here we only notice the difference if you go deep sea diving or if you went to a space station or up a mountain, it would be a different type of breathing because of the pressure. So we've adapted on this planet with this unique set of circumstances. You go somewhere else, another planet, not that any of us have. The point is that these are, our, yeah, and of course we have temperature and all kinds of things. We develop, it, we develop this awareness of this, uh, exterior section and this is part of our situation so we work with that if you start leaning over or bending forward it already we can understand the difference in, of gravity and the way we use the floor so your main support is the floor and gravity in yoga particularly any many exercises in general and then also let's say the uh, one big thing in terms of which influences breathing is your the breathing apparatus in relationship to the spine and its orientation. So in movements and postures, this influences one type of breathing. We do use quite a lot and it's applied in a relaxed yielding way. So we call it like path of least resistance. Um, now this, this type of theory is, or application is contentious in yoga, but the main thing is we try it out. We test it. If you, 
open up and bend back and let go, it might support more inhaling if you bending forward and collapsing and contracting support a bit like a sponge, more exhaling. So without saying you breathe in doing that movement or breathe out doing that movement, most of it, like in Yantra, most of the movements breathe you, even though there are words and numbers. So there's something natural about that side of it. So if you look at it in terms of applying, let's say now this is a Yantra, uh, and this is a, the first group and the first one, it's of the um, camel, well known in yoga, it's a back bend, but here it's in a sequence of seven. So you see these yellow circles that say small volume of air uh, from neutral to expanding bigger air. So you're inhaling, exhaling, put your hands down, and then you go up into the back bend. So here, then we stay, it's holding for four counts in the beginners. Later, it starts to hold as long as you can. So we're interested in this, what we call open hold. We call it Dongwa in Tibetan. So it's this type of sensation when we full of air, we've been moved and shaped, and then we capture that, and it's, then it's a hold. And there are many different holds. So the yantras, this is just one of them, are shaping and breathing you. And so we learn by experience. Most of it's natural. When you come to do holding open, it's, it's, it's less natural. The rest is more this yielding flow. Bend forward, exhale, raise the arms up, inhale, etc. And so after training Yantra, this movement is non-stop with the holds in the middle, the main feature. Here's another concept back to these forces. The bottom dark blue is the water. The top is the space. So a ball, yellow ball, on floating on the water. If we push it down, if we breathe in diaphragmatically, you can try that now if you like, uh, diaphragmatic breathing, it's descending, it's going down. You feel you have more volume of air going in. And if you let go, it returns back with its own force to the surface, to this sort of neutral phase. Or if you breathe just thoracostally, your chest, and you start to fill up, expand, breathing into the chest, gets bigger, bigger volume, and you, you can exhale with timing or you just let go, it will go back to the surface. So these are, there are these forces there based on pressure and gravity. If you develop that theory a bit more, let's say we, it takes effort to blow up a balloon. So if you're really expanding, it's taking effort. But if you let go of the balloon, it doesn't have any effort. So that can then return to the surface uh, naturally without effort. So in, in yoga, we do both. Same with the diaphragm. We can inhale again with, with some effort using muscles, guiding it, the diaphragm is descending. And then if you exhale with force, for example, if you say, ah, or use a ha, ah, or sound, or this is like using, uh, squeezing the sponge and going back more quickly. In this case, the ball now is back on the surface, but smaller because we've actually squeezed it out. And then if it's squeezed and you've exhaled more, if you let go, it will return to this neutral shape. So these are forces it's useful to be aware of, and we play around with them in yoga, not just yantra. Many pranayamas do, do similar, but it's useful to, to be aware of these forces. Uh, same principle, but on a clock, let's say 12 to six, exhale, and, and six to 12 is inhale, but we can separate it and halve it into, into quarters, like in the exhalation. So that, when I said letting go of the balloon is, is really the first part, 12 to three. But there's still air left, then it's like a sponge, you're breathing out from three to six. If I breathe out strongly, for, to, uh, uh, like squeezing out, exhaling more and more, whoops, then, um, uh, then I get to six. If I just relax and let go, the sponge returns and I get to nine back on the surface. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's looking at the same thing. 
our shapes, uh, but we're often breathing above and beyond these shapes in, but we're aware of them. So we, when you look at these numbers then we see lots of different types of breaths, which will focus in a certain area. Let's say 12 plus, to, if you inhale to 12, I might be staying in a posture and developing what we call a uh, geolord, it's called a directed hold. So there's lots of movements we do in Tibetan yoga, not just yantra, where you're holding the breath. You're not locking or blocking, but you're, you're massaging the energy inside with this held breath. And this is characteristic of Tibetan yoga. Or you may close it off by having banders and locks and pushing it down because you want to guide it somewhere specifically like into the central channel. Or maybe you contract the abdomen. So this is also 12 plus, but with extra things like, like a banda. Or you might do a practice or a pranayama where you are, you've uh, exhaled and then you stay there. And then if you, if you did that now and started counting, you have an empty hold. Then we start to, if you do it a long time, this becomes like hypoxic. Uh, this is a very interesting and a lot of pranayamas and breathing practices are working in this area. So we also train in that when we're, we're holding with air and without air. And it's interesting that some of the practices in Tibetan yoga also begin when you exhale after a pranayama, after a visualization. You may exhale normally or with a strong ha or ha pet or something like this. And then your practice begins there. So you've capitalized on an opportunity you've created with strong sensations. Um, these are quite powerful, strong experiences, especially when you repeat them. So the breaths when you're holding and massaging inside can also be seen medically in terms of the five main pranas. And so if you're moving your arms or moving the belly or moving your secret chakra, they can have an influence when, you, when you're holding the breath into these different winds or pranic areas. And when we have sicknesses and disease, uh, according to Ayurveda and Tibetan medicine, these are all dysfunctional or Chinese medicine. Uh, and so then they have become the kind of mother or birth of a particular pathology or problem. So when we're looking at the fix it aspect, we have, we're holding and massaging and sometimes visualizing, trying to get this balancing coordinated circulation. So some of this holding is also like pandiculation, a, a popular word at the moment. Cats do it, we all do it, we do it in bed every, we stretch, we inhale, hold. So this is already like what we're talking about. So back to this uh, murals in Secret Temple, they are, they probably inhaled and hold and start doing a certain movement. But here is, is yogic, rather than spontaneous, like the cat or like this person doing a stretch in the you know, morning, they are having an influence and manipulating the prana inside for a set purpose. And here's one we have in Yantra where we would hold the breath uh, and then start moving the body in a certain way. We can maybe look at this and test it later. Uh, and it starts to have its uh, primary and secondary benefits inside as we start to massage and encourage the prana to go uh, into these channels. You might exhale strongly. In this case, we exhale strongly after uh, massaging or moving the body and then exhale <sighs> a forceful ha. In some practices in Tibetan yoga, again, as I said, that then might begin a mini contemplation. And they're very strong experiences. If we hold the breath, it's a bit like squashing a balloon. Now here is where it's closed, locked inside. This is for a different purpose. So this is in one of the eight movements, one of the preliminaries. This is to introduce a certain held breath, uh, a major component when we use Kumbhaka. So we have a banda naturally occurring at the throat. There's a tension in the perineum. There's a sense of pushing down the breath below the navel. 
the, the posture and the movement into it does that. So it's like you're squashing a balloon or you're pushing it down, creating these different shapes. So we look in terms of um, science all over this, uh, these are experiences. We, we're now in inter interoception. So this fabulous uh, image on the right is the vagus nerve and you see the skull at the top, the, the spine, and these are sort of highlighted this this uh, vagus nerve, which is not the only nerve, but is useful because a lot of yoga is squeezing and bending. And um, I'm just checking time. Yeah, should finish and do some movements. So we're changing the CO2, O2 acid alkaline ratio. And, you know, the yogis didn't know this scientific aspect. And as we squeeze and move, and uh, have an influence on our nervous system and, and other kind of, they, they understood it as channels. And they would visualize them or they even use sound, et cetera. And this is a medical tantra. Uh, but they would, they would get there in the same way. They just didn't have the, the science of these, these terms about uh, acid, alkaline, vagus nerve, et cetera. I think we'll rush to the end now so we can do stuff. We're changing volume here. So yoga is expanding our total lung capacity and, and by training and working with movements and breathing. The yantra is going in at about five to six breaths per minute. That's the green one. Someone who's sick or problematic, they're up there in the red, not healthy. They could be in a stress state or it could be pathological. But the coherence in a continued state of breathing in harmony, smoothly, you get this uh, kind of loved up healing vibe going on. But in a normal erratic uh, conditioned, dualistic conditioned breath, it's very easy for that to influence your nervous system and end up into this incoherence. And the heart doesn't like that. So as you inhale, it tends to put the heart rate up as you exhale down. So if that is erratic, then you get this kind of pattern. If you have this pattern, you have these experiences. So we're looking at smooth, the final uh, edge of uh, breathing after training also is this, this smoothness and, and the egg. And here is uh, Namkar Nobu in the 70s when he started teaching Yantra Yoga. And this is one we'll look at now and hopefully try to get another one or two things I'll finish here. Longer than I thought, sorry. So let's pretend we've done a lot of preparation and we've warmed up our joints. And um, I know some of you might be sitting on a um, chair, so we can't expect you to do fancy yoga. But um, so if I'd done, what's that? Okay, if I'd done a lot of warm ups, I might get to um, my yoga position and then be able to do the breathing. Uh, but I, I wouldn't rush into that, I would get to that position via a lot of preparation. So I will have to pretend I've got all that going. And uh, the one you saw Rimshi doing there, the nine breathing we would get to after a fair amount of mobilizing and shaking, etc. So we'd have to assume we've done that. But it's perfectly reasonable to do it in a chair. Uh, the posture is normally lotus. Uh, but lotus is not obtainable for many people. But you can sit on a chair and have the knees open, providing the chair is low enough and you can put your feet on the floor. Because if you have lotus and we have this posture because I want to control straight back. I want to open up a thoracic cage. The alignment and learning this posture can take a while. You have to do a lot of yoga and then you, the breath flows easier. You have more control. But even sitting on a chair, we have the same, basically, it doesn't matter about the feet thing. We have the same ability to like stack up the vertebra here, like coins, the shoulder blades, it's a bit like an eagle's wing and this is like a swan took down. So we have this alignment. 
so you can watch or just try and go with me. So in training, this would take quite some time to, to go into the detail. Gripping with your thumbs and ring finger to have some tone in the arm that gives us more ability to open up the thoracic chest. Uh, both the back, sides and front. Most people don't have a very deep uh, diaphragmatic breathing and especially not, not here where a lot of people are stuck with anxieties and so forth. But, so in yoga, like the camel and things like that, we, we try to open this. We have more access and you end up with a greater volume and this smoother breath. So without further ado, I'll jump right into this and I'll just coordinate, inhale, exhale into the grip. Finish exhaling here. I begin inhaling and then I escort the breath up. Automatically, my arm lifts up this side, inhaling, then I block it off. And as I'm exhaling through the opposite side, the shoulder relaxes and the rib goes to neutral. Remember, like the ball going to water. But then I'm continuing exhalation as the belly and the diaphragm goes in to empty. I begin in the belly, diaphragmatically. It starts taking it more up on this side. The arm movement does that as you lift up, block off and exhale. Lower a little bit, the ribs turn, return to neutral because they were flared open. And then I continue breathing out the diaphragm. Repeat this normally three each side and three down the middle. So this is high to lift here. The breath is smooth all through the nose. I'm going to cut this short here and then normally you do three each side. And I'm going to do three down the middle or two down the middle. Using the grip, first abdominal, then opening the chest. Filling up. Relaxing the grip. I don't need the arms anymore. Straight back, the belly button goes forward. Exhaling. So now my belly and diaphragm is going in and up. That's like the sponge or the ball is being squeezed. So when I come back up, it makes space. It starts to descend. With the grip, I start to expand and fill up again. So the, the pace and speed of, if I did nine, in a proper way without me talking, etc. Here's a standalone practice we often do before meditation and so forth. And it's it changes the situation. Sometimes you do that, and think, oh, I'm done here. You can just sit and it's, it's nice because you've slowed the breath down, you've smoothed it down. Uh, and if you're really comfortable on the physical stuff, then, then you start to often visualize and enhance the function because you're expelling negative uh, blocks, uh, emotions, pain, problems, something dark, polluted material, exhaling the negative, inhaling the essence of the light, uh, so uh, like healing. So there are many in tantric uh, lineages, um, strange imagery, but the essence is that exhaling the negative and bad, anything that's getting in your way, inhaling the good. Uh, so for a complete practice, eventually we need to have body doing something, the breath doing something, it could be breathing, it could be a sound, it could be a mantra, and the mind with some support, some imagery. In this case, I'm purifying myself. So that's a very a quick, um, brief look at that breathing. Let's look at another one. We need to have enough time for, oh my God. Well, let's, uh, let's put it over to, um, Shall we do one more um, breathing or go for questions? I think we've definitely got time for one more breathing and then we can go to questions. We, could, 
we could probably run over if we want to. But let's say, Thanks, okay, sir. there's um, I don't just be standing here, but uh, I'll come closer. This is how to breathe in. So you have to pretend I'm standing to get the detail and also hear my voice. And inhaling too, you have this grip. And exhaling. So here, when I'm exhaling, I'm also straightening the body and opening my chest. There's a little pressure here. So I'm squeezing on the ribs and the belly. And as I'm straightening up, I'm preparing, I'm emptying, ready to breathe in proper for four, inhaling slowly, two, three, four. I'm going upwards, trying to touch the ceiling. And I stay there for two, but at the top, I'm trying to not only go upwards, I'm trying to, that's why we need a grip, trying to pull apart. So this automatically, biomechanically, if you like, uh, lifts up the sternum to allow breath to go in on the, uh, from, the, from the pectoris minor and other attachments to muscles to our ribs. So in the timing with the movement, it creates space for us to breathe up into this region where we don't normally breathe. Most people don't breathe. So enough chat, I'll just do a couple. You can practice if you like. On the chair, straight back, inhale, two, gripping. Exhale, straighten out in the chest, exhaling, diaphragm is squeezed a little. Inhale into the diaphragm and then automatically that guides the breath in as you're breathing, going upwards, trying to touch the ceiling, stay there and try and pull apart. You'll feel the chest and throat open and head, uh, into, even into the head and then you release, exhale, inhale. Exhale. So we saw earlier um, a, a diagram of the camel open hold, but it's introduced here first. Uh, the top, this is an open hold, strong one. And then the next one takes this feeling and starts to develop it going round, but I don't think we have time for that, unfortunately. So sorry, I've got, I should have had a, uh, been more aware. So let's, <laughs> and I went off into the, the rant with the slides. So if you have any uh, questions about presentation or event yoga in general, please. Uh, and I'm happy to run over. I don't know about other guys. So what do you think, Anne? If, you want, if anybody got written questions or if anybody would like to. Um, yeah, there's some. Um, there's a there's a first uh, written question here and then I'd like to open it up so that you all are able to unmute yourselves and also ask um, but if you feel like you don't want to ask verbally then you can always ask in in writing so one of the questions that arose uh, John, was if one is a, a novice to yoga would you recommend uh, them stopping smoking weed Smoking what? Weed. Weed. Ganja. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I, I think um, when you stop something you're addicted to or like, it's useful to have one or two things to replace it. Uh, something, something good, something you feel good about. Um, now, if you ask a, my teacher and other Tibetan masters, they would, they would completely say, no, it's uh, toxic, it's evil. In modern times, everybody, everybody's smoking it. I'm not saying we should, but clearly we're trying to go away from that. And, and the states I've been talking about after the movement, after the breathing, when you start to get working with the mind, uh, any kind of, even coffee or sugar, anything would be in the way, clearly, because you're, you're, see, what you would bring to the mat there, imagine how your horse would be. The horse on weed, like in a nose bag. It's like I'm addicted to this stuff, or or whatever, craving for this stuff, or I like this stuff. It could be alcoholic. It's like saying, "Can I come, you know, drinking wine every time?" Well, you can do what you like, but the thing is, you're going to notice a problem as you get more subtle. It's going to conflict. 
uh, and we're trying to get really into our you know natural state and and your state's not natural if you're off your head with 20 coffees or you know several pints or splits so you know it you could start like that but as you're learning to to cleanse the lungs and, and purify and so forth it doesn't make sense as you go deeper into it at all no he wouldn't place that because the bliss and joy you would find at the end of yoga you think why am i smoking weed i'm getting high off my own supply right you know what i mean so uh no it doesn't make any sense thank you does anybody else have any questions uh, verbally? I've also got some stuff in the chat. Oh, okay. uh, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. So I just, I've actually written the question out as well, but I also wanted to know how long do you think it would take to sort of develop a practice in this style of yoga? Uh, how long? Like a, a, a meaningful, a meaningful kind of level. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it depends on capacity. Um, if some people have, are quite already on the horse. They did sports and dance or done yoga, you know, so they can pick it up easier. Because um, it, it's, you know, every, we all, in all the practices, you're developing capacity. And I've talked a lot about breathing and, and how the movements breathe you. So, I, I could only say that to each individual. And if I have 20 people, you know, five are gonna be fast track because they, they're, they're aware of the horse. They, I don't know, just their body type, the, the, the matrix of the elemental mix, you know, the constitutional type, the balance of emotions and harmony or whatever, and, or they've done dance or sports and they, you know, they get it quickly. Someone else comes and is just, whatever with a nervous system or or some physical injury or whatever needs more care and attention so i i cannot say it varies enormously so it some people get it quickly so you could have an introduction over a weekend and it's like they're off you just need a refresher and a, and a book uh, and come back to go deeper you know in terms of basic others take months and months i can't answer that everybody's unique You'd have to tell me a lot of detail about you, like uh, my age, I've got no injuries, I don't, you know, no vices, and I'm, I'm used to this, and I, I could give an estimate, but without knowing that, I couldn't. And, and um, just as a follow-up, sorry, could I just, and <clears throat> how do you find it doing it virtually? Do you think it's, it's feasible, or is it always going to be a challenge? Yeah, I mean, like this. Uh, well, since uh, mm -hmm. COVID, I've been thriving online if you like i mean uh the, the limit of this pros and cons i it's uh you know i can't touch people i can't hear the breathing there are limitations definitely and i think some of my students we we, we can't wait to meet so I, I can't wait to just have that extra feedback you do in physical but there's a lot you know, I, I think we're, you know, 90, 95%. There's a lot you can do, especially, you know, if, if somebody wants to go more into it, like I do one-to-ones with people as well. And then uh, so I can listen to the breath or put the camera closely. Yeah, so it's okay. It's just obviously not 100%, maybe 90, 95. I would limit the numbers though, so I can have feedback. If I have a huge, uh, I've got a big screen here. Uh, and if I go from more than 20 or something, it's like <laughs> I need to go to spec savers and I'm looking at the screen and uh, the camera is dark and, you know, it's a bit clunky. But I model along and it's okay. Yes, no problem so far. Hi, John. I just wanted to ask a personal question, if you don't mind. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I was just wondering, in your yoga practice, have you ever had moments when you recognized your Rikpa? <laughs> yeah, key, key important question. Um, I'd like to think so, but it, um, and I've been with Namkai in Northern many years, and he's always, he's always the main point to any of the teachings and transmissions and any of the more serious books. Uh, I, I have some understanding and some experience of that, yes. I think so. In terms of stability and integrating with it, that's another story. It's not so easy because uh, we, we, we easily get distracted and um, 
So it's a question of uh, stability and integration. So it's after yogic practices, so in my, from my point of view, I may taste or glimpse for some moments, for example. Uh, but then if you start moving and thinking, and then it's not so easy, for example. So the idea of optimizing the opportunity in yoga in general, I mean, any yoga, if they, you know, they might arrive in Rikpa and not know what it, it's, it's Rikpa, but they don't know it's called Rikpa. It's possible, you know, ar arrive feeling uh, completely uh, present with their own awareness and really, you know, and even testing it with moving the body and not being bothered by thoughts, because the whole issue of Rikpa is also in the big debate, is it, can you have thoughts and not be bothered by them, or is it absence of thoughts? Well, I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> but so on body, speech, and mind, so yes, but uh, with, um, but, but in terms of capacity and, and integrating, no, it's, it's not so easy. But having any one second, one flavor is, has so much value. I am just so keen to get students to the main point so we get to that. That's the whole point of Yantra and yoga in general. All of those practices, if they're not going to Rikpa, as far as I'm concerned, it's like missing the main point, so to speak. So uh, that is really, a, it's not an obsession, but I think it's, it has the highest value. And if, if then they have some sense of that, because it's beyond words, then it's like, okay, job done. It's like they know how to reconnect <clears throat> and uh, touch that. And the more, the more they can get close to that and touch that, that's going to re have the possibility of replacing all the negative stuff we constantly get sucked in, the dualistic stuff. So it has high value. It doesn't have to be a lot, one second, for example. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you so much. John, just um, thank you so much for your question. Um, John, there's a question in the chat from Anna, and uh, what she's asking is is whether the physical body and can the physical body being out of alignment affect our emotional and mental health? Yeah, yeah. If you think of um, alignment, then sometimes that means also pain or nerves being trapped or it depends if you mean structural, because I, in the clinic, I deal with a lot of pain and there's not alignment there. So that would get in the way, but obviously sometimes emotions can give birth to, uh, to, to, to disarrange and detangle the body, you know, because of a, if you look at people who have obstructive emotions, let's say you have a, a strong experience like loss, uh, grief, sadness of loss, or trauma, how, th how that shapes your body, uh, how it can weaken the body and start to block circulation and change your body. Uh, and some people can be fixed for a long time in very strong affective emotions. I mean, not necessary even to the level where you have a strong mental emotional problem. So it can be, I, it can go either way. That's why I call the speech, body speech and mind can be middle either way. So emotions, of breath can affect the, the mind or the brain as well as the body and, and change the body. Because you can see people, they'll everybody has a certain shape. You see it clearly when we get older. You look at your grandparents and things. I mean, some of it's gravity and wear and tear, but if, if you see friends or people of age, and especially if they've been with a, a strong afflictive emotion for a long time, they'll have a certain shape and you can start to understand certain emotions uh, sit and feature on certain parts of the body. And if, if you start to wrap around a certain uh, afflictive emotion for a long time, then slowly the body deranges itself that way. So it can come uh, in the middle either way, it can go up or down. Thank you very much, John.